okay? Yeah? One, two. Well, good morning, everybody. Hello, how you doing? Welcome to uh, Elim Christian Centre Glossop. Uh, for those who maybe don't know me, uh, if you're a guest with us, my name is Tim, and I am so pleased that you're all here uh, this morning. It's awesome to have you, and just really looking forward to, to spending this time together. Uh, if you are a guest, we'd love you to have one of these uh, guest packs. Uh, in there, there's a few little goodies. Um, there's a a drink and some treats and things, but there's also a welcome card, which if you want to connect with us, um, then please do fill that out and uh, drop it in the uh, desk over here. And, uh, oh, sorry, at the back, sorry, drop your contact card at the back, uh, and I will get in touch, and either we can meet up for a brew, just to get to know one another, and I promise I won't ask for your credit card details or anything, um, you're safe. I might even just pay for the brew as well, if you're really lucky. Yeah, exactly. Most people have found out the hard way. I say that up here, and then when I show up, I let them pay. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you'd like to meet up for a brew, we'd be really happy to do that. Um, but if that feels a bit too intense, but you'd like to know what's happening in the life of the church, you can sign up for our newsletter as well, and we send out an email once a week. And you can just nosy around and see what's happening in the life of our, our church family, and you're welcome to do that. Um, a couple of things that I just want to let you know about in the life of our church family before we uh, kick off. Uh, first of all, I'm really excited about this. Um, for Lent this year, we're going to be doing um, Lent prayer, um, which I'm so looking forward to. The idea is basically that uh, John Mark Homer, um, a guy who talks a lot about uh, how we grow as followers of Christ, he says to be a follower of Jesus is basically a call to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do as Jesus did. And so for 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at lunchtime, we just want to take some time to be aware of God's presence with us, um, to pray that he would increasingly shape us to be like him, and that we would live out our lives as he would want us to live. And so we're going to do that 15 minutes in the morning, so 7.30 a.m. for those of you who don't have kids, <laughs> or do have kids and can do that, um, 7.30 a.m. and then 12.30 at lunchtime. Um, check your emails and there'll be a Zoom link to do it. Um, but yeah, I would love you to join me uh, in, in that. Uh, so we'll be doing that Monday to Thursday um, every week throughout Lent. Um, also just, oh, it starts on the Wednesday. So this coming Wednesday is when it all kicks off. Thank you, Joe. That's great. Helping me out on my notices. Good job. Um, okay, and then the final thing uh, to say is just we have a, another CAP money course. Um, this is all about helping people budget better, have a healthier relationship with their money so that the money isn't controlling them, but they can use their money for the things that are really important in life, honoring God, serving others, um, and supporting ourselves. Uh, so if you would like to be a part of that, um, you can sign up for it. It's going to be on Thursday evenings, uh, 7 o'clock, so for, on the 7th of March for four weeks. So if you want to get involved in that, you are more than welcome to. But I'm starting to get tired of my own voice. I don't know about you guys. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll talk to him later. Um, if you want to stand to your feet, we're going to worship Jesus together. Wonderful. I just want to invite you, maybe, if you feel comfortable to do this, um, just to close your eyes where you are. And I want to invite you to just focus your heart and attention on Jesus. In all the hustle and bustle and seeing people and talking, it's easy for us to miss the fact that he's here with us in this moment. And he's good. And he wants to meet with us. It's just an amazing privilege. So I just want to read this scripture to you. It's Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes. 
in people in whom there is no salvation. Because when their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. But blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food for the hungry. Isn't that wonderful? The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the travelers. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. And by the way of the wicked, he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. All you generations, praise the Lord. Lord, I thank you. That's who you are. That you set the prisoner free. You open the eyes of the blind. You lift up those who are bowed down and you love the righteous. God, I pray that you would meet with us this morning and that we would honor you in our worship. In your name, amen. Let's worship, shall we? Through every trial, through every circumstance, still your mercy covers me. Through every battle, I don't have to understand, still I lift my voice. Let's sing that again, through every trial. Through every trial, through every circumstance, still your mercy covers me. Through every battle, I don't have to understand, still I lift my voice and sing, today, tomorrow and forever, I will live for you, today. You have been faithful, you have been kind to me, you hold my future in your hands. When the world's shaking, the ground beneath my feet, you're the solid rock on which I stand. Today, today, tomorrow and forever, I will live for you. Let's make it our prayer. Today, tomorrow and forever, I will worship. Let's sing that again. Today, tomorrow. Today, tomorrow and forever, I will live for you. Today, tomorrow and forever, I will worship you. I'll worship you. storm I'll worship I'll worship you on the mountain and in the valley I'll worship you in the calm and in the storm today tomorrow and forever I will worship you today tomorrow and forever I will worship Yes, I will worship you. Oh, I will worship you. We're going to sing, give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. 
why don't you bring to mind something this morning that perhaps you can give thanks to God for. Something that means a lot to you. Something that you can sing your praises to him this morning and say thank you so much God for this. Whatever it may be. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Is love and just forever for the life that's been reborn? Is love and just forever? Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise to Him. Sing praise, sing praise for. Again, he is faithful forever. God is faithful forever. God is strong forever. God is with us forever. Forever. From the rising to the setting sun. His love endures forever, and by the grace of God we will carry on. His love endures forever. you but I just love singing the, the the phrase forever God is with us I think it's such a great reminder that no matter what is happening that no matter what we're facing whether we're in a place of like joy or struggle or difficulty forever God is with us and that's not just on earth that's like eternity forever God is with us and I think I'm reminded of his faithfulness in that because the Bible says that when we are faithless he remains faithful and I love that. It's not we're singing, forever we're with you, God. Forever we're with you. It's forever he's with us. That's the commitment that he's made to us. And if that's not a reason to just celebrate and praise him this morning, I don't know what it is. So let's just sing that chorus once, twice, who knows, a couple more times. And let's just thank God for who he is. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the covenant that you've made with us. We thank you, God, that you remain faithful to us always and forever into eternity. 
In Jesus' name, amen. The kids uh, are going to go out, so we've got youth upstairs, which if uh, youth is kind of to the right, my right, your left, <laughs> and, and up the stairs, and then adventurers is to the left. Um, Lord, I just want to pray for, for our children, for our youth, our young people. Lord, I want to thank you so much for them. God, the example that they are, the childlike faith that they have. Um, and Lord, we just pray your blessing in their, in their times that they have this morning, that they really encounter your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to leave some space in this song, so we might kind of play around this song for a little while, but I actually thought it's a cool opportunity um, for those of us who may not experience this, just to kind of go, God, what are you, what are you saying to me? Um, or perhaps in moments of space, you want to sing out a song to God, or you want to pray, but we're just going to leave space for the Holy Spirit just to move and encourage us and stir us up. Um, maybe you want to put a hand on, on the person's shoulder next to you if you feel that's right and just pray, pray over them. But we're here to build one another up and encourage one another and ask that the Holy Spirit comes and does that as well. And so we're going to sing this song, but we're just going to have a time of space as well. If faith can move the mountains, let the mountains move. We come with expectation, waiting here for you. Waiting here for you. You're the Lord of all creation. Still you know my heart, the author of salvation. You loved us from the start. Waiting here for you, with our hands lifted.
So if this is feeling just a bit strange, a bit foreign to you, I just encourage you in this moment just to think of something of who God is that fills your soul with a deep sense of love and gratitude and worship. And maybe you just want to pray it quietly in your mind. Lord, thank you that you're holy. Thank you that you're kind. Maybe you want to just pray it quietly where you are. Maybe you want to just sing out that attribute of
give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, it's your grace. Shout your praise, and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we
Thank you for your presence with us. Lord, thank you that all the earth will show your praise. And our hearts will cry. And the stones will sing. Great. Maybe there's a, a few folk here feel comfortable just to shout out an attribute of God that you want to celebrate and honor. So probably what's going to happen is someone's going to shout out one thing, another person's going to shout out another thing, and, and maybe there's going to be some clashes. Let's not worry about that. Um, but let's just together, as we bring this time to a close, recognize who God is amongst us. So should we do that? Thank you that you're holy, Jesus. On the cross, you made a public spectacle of the powers of darkness, and the conquering king was raised. in that, when we recognize him, when we celebrate him, it's like it just fills his heart with joy. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it, to worship him. Amen. So Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we honor you. You're welcome in this place, in our hearts, in your name. Amen. 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 You can take your seats if you would like to. It just reminds me of um, the scripture I read at the start. The Lord sets the prisoner free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down, and the Lord loves the righteous. I just, uh, I love that, absolutely love it. Uh, so we're really privileged today. I, I noticed Bill and Kathy have joined us. It is great to see you both. Welcome. It's uh, really good. Oh, you get a round of applause as well. Not quite a stand innovation, so I feel slightly insulted, but you know, um, it's great to see you both, and uh, yeah, wonderful to have you with us. It's also great to have um, Craig and Abby Brotherstone with us. Uh, over from Northern Ireland, it is awesome to have you both. Yeah, you can clap, that's allowed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, honestly, it's a real privilege and honor to have them and their family with us. Um, we've spent the whole weekend with them and it's just been a joy. Um, I would, I'm gonna let Craig come up here and he'll tell you more about himself in a moment, but all I would say is what you see is what you get. Um, I think both Craig and Abby live and breathe a love for God, a love for Jesus, and a love for people. And it's an infectious thing. And so I'm really pleased that they're here today, and I am looking forward to all that God might want to say to us as a church family. So I'm going to shut up. I'm going to invite Craig. Uh, can we give him a warm welcome, please? And listen, what a joy to be in Glossop for the first time in this life-giving and life-filled church. It's such a privilege to be here. I would like to echo some of those words as well. Big thanks to Pastor Tim, Pastor Joel, and the leadership team for allowing us this opportunity to come and share a little bit with you today. Um, and just to say, I've had the privilege of watching Pastor Tim's journey since Bible college from a distance. 
Um, and amazing to see the consistent man of God that he is and how God has continued to use him throughout all of these years and still some life left, I think, yeah, in the old dog, so there we go. <laughs> um, I appreciate you don't know us today, so really quickly, I am Craig. Um, my wife is Abby. I'm originally from Belfast. She's originally from upstate New York. We've been on a couple of journeys through life. We have four daughters, uh, Sienna, Elisa, Ariella, and Tamara, and they are aged between six and 13. Um, and again, we're on a bit of an adventure with God that I'll explain a little bit later. We're going to read together two Bible passages, if that's okay. One from the very beginning of the Bible and one from the very end. And I promise not to stop at every book in between. So we'll go with Genesis at the beginning of the Bible, if that's okay. Chapter 11. Um, if you'd like to turn with me, feel free to do that. I'm going to read from verses 1 to 9 in Genesis 11. The whole earth had the same language and vocabulary. As people migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make oven-fired bricks. They used brick for stone and asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky. Let's make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered throughout the earth. Then the Lord came down to look over the city and the tower that the humans were building. The Lord said, if they have begun to do this as one people, all having the same language, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So from there, the Lord scattered them throughout the earth and they stopped building the city. Therefore, it is called Babylon, for there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them throughout the earth. And then if you'll turn with me to the very end, we're going to read from Revelation, uh, which is the very last book in the Bible, chapter 7, and I'm going to read from verses 9 to 17. So Revelation, chapter 7, verses 9 to 17. And after this I looked... And there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and along with the elders and the four living creatures, they fell face down before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, Who are these people in white robes and where did they come from? I said to him, sir, you know, then he told me these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. The one seated on the throne will shelter them. They will no longer hunger. They will no longer thirst. The sun will no longer strike them, nor will any scorching heat. For the lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to springs of the waters of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Amen. Our third daughter, Ariella, is obsessed with lip balm. When I say that she's obsessed, she owns a lot of them. Everyone in my family knows that with every birthday present and every Christmas present, there should be an assortment of lip balms included as part of that. Or only lip balm, if that's what suits. She doesn't just like them in one color or one particular brand or one particular flavor. She loves lip balm so much that she wants them in every flavor and every color and every brand, and she is not selective at all. And our God is obsessed with people. 
And he wants them in his family from every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language. He knows all about the people in Afghanistan and Algeria and American Samoa. And he loves the Uyghurs and the Uzbeks and the Urdu. And he wants to be worshipped in Icelandic and Ibis and Irish. He wants everyone. But the very least that he will settle for on that day is every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language. You could say every nation. Yes, every. Every tribe. Every language. Yes, every. And we read a passage in Genesis 11 that explained to us at one time people spoke all the same language and with the same vocabulary. Now lots of us in here are English speakers, but even we will have different vocabulary. All the people spoke with the same. They wanted to build a great city for themselves with a tower that reaches the sky. Why? This will make us famous and this will keep us from being scattered. The Lord stopped the building so that they wouldn't become famous and so that they would be scattered all over the world and he confused their languages. The idea to God that they would not scatter was not okay. This was not part of his plan for the world. So actually, we can see through this that the spread of the gospel is actually meant to be difficult in some ways as part of God's plan. Languages are meant to be confusing on some level and take time to learn because that this is the way that God set it up from the very beginning. One of the reasons I think that is, and there will be many that I continue to learn, is that we stay humble before him and don't think that we're better than we are. I remember when we moved to Russia in 2014, and I'd spent 10 years of my life in ministry trying to learn about communication and become better at that in some ways. And then you show up in a country and you can barely say Jesus loves you at the beginning. And even when you do say it, they can't even understand what you're trying to say. And there's this whole journey, isn't there, with languages and the big world that is out there. But let's be honest with ourselves today when we think about this Tower of Babel. How many times is it our natural desire, me included, that the bigger is better, that in some ways we would want to create something that sort of lets people look at us? How many times is it our natural desire for us not to be scattered? I personally hate goodbyes, and this is coming from a missions guy, and it's very difficult for me every time. We think bigger is better, but sometimes I wonder, is God thinking that wider is better, that there's something of his plan in this. Why would that be? Because contrary to our human wisdom, God won't just settle for gossip people in heaven. You might have your own special section, but <laughs> he wants every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language. And near the start of Genesis, we get this insight, don't we, into God's plan from the very beginning. That he, conf he confused with different languages and he scattered people all over the world. And at the end of the book in Revelation, we understand why even more, don't we? Because this journey that we are all on ends with a vast crowd. Too many people to count, it's too big. And there's people there from every nation, tribe, people, and language shouting with a great roar, salvation belongs to our God collectively who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And the Brazilians are there. And the Evenki people from northern Siberia are there. And the English are there. That should at least get an amen. And the Estonians are there. And the Yemeni are there. And the Rajput. And this thought of every nation, tribe, people, and language I have four questions for us today, and I promise they're not that long. But the first question is this. What does this say about God? This thought of every nation, people, tribe, and language, what does this say about God? What does this desire to have people from every nation, tribe, and language say about Him? In a quick answer, I think it says that He is really big, right? Because you and I 
can't even think about every people, tribe, nation, and language. That is too big, isn't it, for our minds to even comprehend. He is really big. We naturally tend to think of in terms of people in our local town or city or country. We think about people that we know, don't we? People that we have met before. That can include people from other places. But even that is quite restrictive. We have a number of Nigerian families in the church that we lead in Dublin. And so my version of 231 million people in Nigeria is sort of restricted to about the 20 families that I know. And I could easily think, oh, I know Nigeria, but I really, really don't. It's so much bigger, isn't it? How God is thinking his eyes on every single person on the planet today. It's interesting because if we have a conversation, you can sort of pick out the missions people at times because sometimes they want to talk to you about people that they have never met and places they have never been. And we all know that's not the natural thing to do. But God, he is really big. And he loves people from every nation and tribe and language. This speaks of his bigness. Really quickly, Isaiah 40. I'm going to read a couple of verses if that's okay. Some of you will know this chapter as well. An incredible chapter about the bigness of God. Verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or marked off the heavens with the span of his hand. We were talking yesterday, I can barely get an octave on the keyboard, you know what I mean? <laughs> Measured off the heavens. Who has gathered the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains on a balance and the hills on a scales. How do you even begin to weigh a mountain? <laughs> Who has directed the spread of the Lord or gave him counsel? Who did he consult? Who gave him understanding and taught him the paths of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Look, the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They're considered a speck of dust on the scales. He lifts up the islands like fine dust. Our God is big. Amen. Verse 22 in that chapter says he sits above the circle of the earth. And I'm sure Pastor Tim can explain that to you, but I can't. I don't know what that means. But I just know it's really big and really high and really far. And it's trying to describe something to us about the bigness of the God that we serve. And a big God is not content with worship from just a couple of nations. A big God is not content with worship and salvation across a couple of tribes or even many languages. Our big God is setting this whole plan up so that one day we will all stand together in a crowd too vast to count. Hopefully you'll get some high fives from me on that day, but from every nation and tribe and people and language. Secondly today, what does this say about his church? We know that Jesus is building his church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And his church is made up of people from every nation, tribe, people, and language. It is a global church. It is a diverse church. That's where it's headed towards, even if we haven't quite got there yet. In Ephesians 3 and verses 7 to 10, the apostle Paul says, By God's grace and mighty power, I've been given the privilege of serving him by spreading the good news. Spreading it. Though I'm the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. But listen to verse 10 in the New Living Translation. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Firstly, this is one of my favorite verses whenever we think about the church of Jesus Christ today. That God uses his church in its rich variety to display his wisdom to the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. What an amazing verse to think about and meditate on and consider what is happening through God's church today. I'm sure many of you didn't wake up out of bed this morning thinking about that, you know. I'm off to see this place where God's going to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Woo! But, 
that's what's happening here today. That's why his church is so epic and awesome and amazing and significant and full of purpose and full of his heart too. And I can only assume that as I try to work this out, that the flaws in the church only add to the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms awe of God. He uses them. <laughs> He put that team together to do this. He put those groups of people and all the, who would, this is amazing what God is up to. But also the wisdom and the spread of the gospel and establishing the church in every people, tribe, nation, and language. This plan is too big for anyone else to accomplish. This goal is too awesome and incredible. And yet that is what God is using his church to do today. Who else could come up with a plan like this? Only him. Stephen Neal, the missiologist, some of you might have heard of him before, wrote a book called The History of Christian Missions. And he put it this way. Christianity alone has succeeded in making itself a universal religion. It has found a home in almost every country in the world. It has adherence among all the races of man from the most sophisticated of Westerners to the Aborigines of the inhospitable deserts of Australia. And there is no religion in the world which has not yet yielded a certain number of converts to it. Can you see God's plan? Can you see what he's doing through his church? Can you see what you are a part of today? It is incredible. Every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language. And you know what? There's something of locations in this. I'm not sure that God is as concerned as we are about how his church organizes themselves in certain seasons of life as he is concerned about the big picture. From what I understand, Glossop Elam is almost 140 years old. <laughs> that is an amazing thought and concept about a presence here. And I would be confident that even Mick, could probably not name every pastor and church leader that has ever been here in 140 years. Prove me wrong, I'll give you a tenner. But I'm not sure that that has been the whole point. But I can tell you that consistently through the years, there has been a Pentecostal evangelical church in Glossop that has represented God and his gospel down through the generations that also is seen in this church today, that you have the generations represented all the way from babies to, we'll not talk about that, but everyone in between. It's incredible. And I think that that is something in God's heart. We actually don't know that much about the church in Antioch and how it was arranged we don't get the name of the person who pioneered it and started it. But we do know there was a church in Antioch. Why? The New Testament and especially the book of Acts doesn't give us all the who's who's of the church at every time. We do get names. We do get insights. But you know what we get more of in the New Testament? Locations. Because on God's heart is every people, tribe, nation, and tongue. On God's heart is the spread of his gospel. And it's trying to explain something to us about how that happened, where it went, how God was at work at that time. And I would love all of us to lift up our eyes and look at the big picture of what God is doing and what we are a part of and be amazed as God uses his church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to the unseen rulers and the heavenly and uh, unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Number three, what does this say about me? And when I say me, I don't just mean looking at me and this is about Craig. I mean for all of us. What does this say about me? Matthew twenty four and verse fourteen. The good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come or that it will be preached to all peoples is really what the root word is there that this gospel will spread to every nation tribe people and language and then he also said in Matthew 28 verses 18 to 20 the great commission I'm sure many of you know it 
Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus absolutely believed that this vision of every nation, tribe, people, and language was for the whole church, was for me, was for you. What does this look like in our lives? In Matthew 24, we have this statement about the end, the big picture. Jesus says, this is the story I am writing across the world, that this gospel will spread to every people, that we would see the big picture of God's redemptive story. Do you know, God is not just at work in my life, although I appreciate that gets more focus <laughs> than other people and other things. And I get it. Sometimes that's all I can deal with today <laughs> is what God is doing in me. But it's also that he wants to use us to reach out to other people around us and even to the very nations of the earth. It's also that he's doing something in us that is meant to spread. And what does that look like for each of us? So he says to us, go and make disciples of all the nations. This great vision and picture and story that is being written in world history in 2024 requires a bunch of vapor people, people that are here today and gone tomorrow, the short journey called life that we all have. So what does every nation, tribe, people, and language say to me today in 2024? It gives a whole different perspective, doesn't it, on you and I interacting as the church of Jesus Christ. It gives a whole different perspective to our life goals and our bucket lists and what we plan to do over the next number of months and years. God wants to use me to make disciples of people who will stand in this crowd from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Wow. And we all have to say to ourselves, Jesus is talking to me too. I have the privilege of partnering with him and what he's doing in the world today. I have to say in faith that I believe that there are missionaries still to come from this church as well. That God could even send one or two of you or many of you, I don't know, or people that are still to come even to the nations of the earth in its various ways that God could do that. Could I encourage you to do a couple of things as we consider this today? I'm aware that some of you might be very aware of this stuff, but some of you also might not have ever thought about some of this before. If you have never looked at the Joshua Project website, so it's joshuaproject.net, can I encourage you today to do that? Even for 10 minutes when you go home, sometime in the afternoon or the evening or whatever. Joshuaproject.net. There you have a breakdown of the 7,246 people groups that are still unreached in the world today. They represent 3.4 billion people or 42% of the earth's population today. We have not landed this plane yet in getting the gospel to every nation, tribe, people, and language. And so it would be amazing for God's whole church to get more informed about that, even just to pray. God, that I could pray for a people group that isn't reached yet, that I could pray in a different way or a more informed way about what you are doing in the earth today. If I could encourage you to do that, that would be amazing. Can I encourage you to ask the Lord afresh, what part do you want me to play in this story that we are hurtling towards in Revelation chapter 7? It is truly incredible that Jesus involves us in his plans. Fourthly and lastly, what does all of this say and mean for the Brotherstons? So now you can relax. You don't need to worry. There's no pressure on you. We have talked the last number of years a lot about goers and senders and prayers some people are called to be prayers. I'm not just talking about sort of a little sort of prayer time, but some people that really intercede for missions and what God is doing 
globally. And absolutely, there is a call on his church to do that. Some people are called to be senders, to send missionaries out, to encourage them, to bless them on their way, to be involved in their care and concern for them. And some people are called to be goers, to pick up their lives and move somewhere else cross-culturally for the spread of the gospel on the earth today. The Apostle Paul described it in Romans 15 and verse 20. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. And this has been something of our family story so far. Abby was brought up in Rochester, New York, not far from the Canadian border, and her parents were pastors in a church of over 1,500 people in New York State. And at age 50, they moved themselves to Denmark and joined a church of about 70 people and were involved as missionaries there for 21 years until they just moved back to America. Abby lived there for two years when she was 17. I grew up in Belfast in a very working class community and we had barely traveled when at 18 I moved to New York City and served for four years with Metro World Child in the city there and got a picture for cross-cultural mission. Then our journey has taken us together from New York back to Belfast, to Siberia, to the west of Ireland, and to the south of Ireland. And in August 2024, we will move our family of six to Tallinn in Estonia to continue our journey together. We'll be working with a church network there called EKNK. That's an abbreviation, obviously. And they are Elam Global Partners already. So that has been an amazing connection, and we're excited to work with them. We will probably do a range of things, including supporting smaller, struggling churches, raising up young leaders, helping move church planting forward in that country. But we are also open to however the Lord wants to lead us in those days ahead. We're an amazing space in Estonia to be part of the European Union and what God is doing in that sphere, but also to work with some Russian speakers, of which there are 300,000 of them that have Russian as a first language. And we're excited to partner with Elam Missions in this journey, and especially in looking at the link between the UK and Ireland and the mission field in Europe, to look at trips and training and what this can mean for raising the next generation of disciple makers across the nations. And we would love a team from Glossop to come out at some stage and join us, or even just because it's talent, it's not that far away, Ryanair flies there, among others, that if you find yourself in Tallinn for any reason, for a weekend or whatever, please contact us and we'd love to meet up with you and to, to share in any way, to connect and all of that too, because there is this link that we're really keen to partner with God's church in. There's a great need for the gospel in Europe as well as the Slavic world. And we are genuinely excited to be asked by God to partner with him and what he's doing in that space and to explore all that this means for our family. So what this also means for the Brotherstons is that we get to go around churches and to share a bit. And you've been very kind to allow us to do that today, to go around churches, invite people to partner with us. So there, are, there is an email sign-up sheet at the back if you would like our newsletter, which goes out a couple of times a year, just so don't get worried that you're going to get a daily update from Craig <laughs> about what's going on, you'll just stay connected with the journey. It's an easy way to do that. There's no pressure, but we would love you to sign up, and you're more than welcome to do that as well. We also have an Instagram page. Anybody on Instagram, you can find us at Brotherston Missions. So dead simple, Brotherston Missions. Feel free to sign up there, and that'll keep you updated. Um, and we have these packs at the back that we'd love everyone to take. Inside there are some cards with our family photo in case you uh, are interested. But more than that, more like a prayer card to remind you to pray for us. But also what's on there is my personal email address. So if you want to contact us at any time or you have a question or whatever, then fe please feel free to do that as well. And I will definitely reply to your email. Um, and then one of the interesting parts of following God's call into missions and how it's all set up is that you have to raise your own finances too. And in an amazing way, God mostly uses his church 
to do this. And I used to be awkward about this when we were going to Russia in 2014. I refused to talk about it and always called the pastor up of the church to do this part and whatever. I've grown up a little bit since then. And I also read a book called The Spirituality of Fundraising by Henry Nguyen, which really helped me about inviting people into the partnership that could be. So I decided this time around I'd be more obedient and I would talk about it. So we are inviting you into a partnership with the mission of God that he has placed in front of us. And I can tell you, as we know from the widow's offering of Mark 12, it's not actually about how much anybody gives. But I do want to say, if any of you ever contribute financially to anything we've been called by God to do, we are so grateful and thankful to you and your family and your lives as you do that. But I can tell you today what would be best for us. So inside those packs as well is an opportunity to sign up for a direct debit if you'd be interested in that. For us as a family, lots of people giving five pounds a month is the best thing for us to know what income is coming in. And then also if donors drop out, and there's many reasons for that over time, that then it's not quite as destabilizing for us as well. So I would love you to consider that before the Lord, to pray about it. And if you're interested, the information is there too. I'm going to wrap up. But I'm going to read Revelation 7, verse 9 one more time. After this, I looked. There was a vast multitude from every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. We serve a big God who is using his church to spread his gospel to every nation, tribe, people, and language, who is asking you and I in our various ways and callings and talents and abilities to make disciples of all the nations. And I wonder what he is saying to you and I today. I'm going to read what is my favorite poem. I don't have enough time to tell you who C.T. Studd is, but feel free if you don't know about him as a missionary to Google him at home, C.T. Studd. But this is my favorite. Let me read it to you. Two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice, gently pleads for a better choice bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears. Each with its days I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep. In joy or sorrow, thy word to keep. Faithful and true, whate'er the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn. And from the world now let me turn. Living for thee and thee alone. Bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life. Yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say, "Twas worth it all. Only one life, twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ 
faithful life. Let us pray together. And I wonder for just this moment, even in your seat, I could invite you to just put two hands out in front, open hands before the Lord. I know it's a physical thing, but also a spiritual thing. To say, God, here's my little life. Filled with huge significance and purpose. But also acknowledging, God, I'm just one of eight billion people alive in the world today. Here's my life. Yes, only one. And just to ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? What from the Bible has spoken to you today? What has the Holy Spirit been whispering in your ear? Father God, we are so privileged today for all of us who follow you to know we will be in that crowd too great to count of people from every nation tribe, people and language we will be shouting salvation belongs to our God thank you Lord God, we celebrate your bigness today and we acknowledge our smallness in light of that, not our insignificance, but compared to you, we can't even comprehend or fathom your heart for those 8 billion people, your heart for those unreached people groups, your heart for your gospel to be spread and continue to be. Father God, today we thank you for your church displaying your wisdom in its rich variety God thank you we get to be part of your church and God I want to thank you that the most significant churches the most significant works from you are not just in the big cities or the big places but God you are using your church in various shapes and sizes and forms. You are using your church in villages and in towns and in cities. You are using your church across every nation, tribe, people, and language. So God, we thank you for this church and what you're doing, but also God acknowledging the potential that is in it. God, I pray we would all ask today, we would all respond with action to you. What does this mean for me? What missionaries are in this room? What future leaders in your kingdom are upstairs and to the room over here? What part does this church play in impacting the nations of the world? Would you use us, we pray. Father God, we just pray that you would get all the glory, all the honor, all the praise that you are due. And we thank you for the privilege of being your children. In Jesus' name. Wonderful. Thank you uh, so much, Craig, for being with us, and Abby as well. It's great to have you here, and um, I hope that stirs your heart as it stirs mine. 
I find when I hear Craig talk about these things, it's wonderfully humbling because you kind of realize, you know, everything we do, we're a small part of God's amazing plan for the whole of this earth because he loves people so much. And uh, it just excites me that I get to be part of a a human-sized person, part of a God-sized mission. Isn't that amazing? Uh, So bless you all. Thank you so much for coming out this morning. There's refreshments at the back. There's Craig's packs over there. I would love you to pick one of those up and take it home with you. And I'm now going to stop talking and release you. God bless. See you.